Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Brabbit. I'm the Associate Dean for External Relations here at the Law School. And it is such a pleasure to be with all of you today as you start this journey and your clinic experience when Professor Wiebe invited me to um, give the welcome this afternoon. I was particularly excited about that because as a lawyer, I loved the practice of law and I absolutely loved working with clients. And that's what all of you signed up for in this clinic experience. So to be with you on this special day as you start this fabulous semester serving people most in need, it feels a little bit like coming home. A very, very special welcome to Judge Barnett. It is a tremendous honor to hear from you today and to have you with us today. A very special welcome to all of you students. Your gifts and your talents are about to meet a very significant need. And I hope that it is a very powerful experience to you in a changing way. A very special tip of the hat to the clinic faculty and staff. You are exemplary, committed, mission-driven role models in every way. As part of my welcome, I'd like to offer an observation to all the students. Your clinic experience, in my opinion, is the gateway to understanding the heart of the practice. At its core, law is about people and relationships. When you study the law, sometimes the people, the actors, they become blurry images in the background. The Socratic method, analyzing sections of appellate decisions, IRAC issue spotting, drilling into judicial decision-making about really, really important issues is a necessary part of teaching you to think like a lawyer. But these things are not the complete story. And in fact, they tend to pull your gaze away from the individuals at the very heart of the issue. As you bring your lawyering skills to the table in your clinic experience, we want to challenge you to also be a student of the people you're serving so you can think like a St. Thomas lawyer. What is the client's lived experience? How does that lived experience play into this case? I promise you it does, but I will also tell you sometimes it's not so obvious. Let me give you an example. One of my clients, Jackie, had been diagnosed with juvenile um, idiopathic scoliosis as a young child, well, long and before she ever came to me. She shared that with me in an effort to help me understand the connection between her struggles and the case. But at the time she shared that with me, I was mired in dispositive motions and depositions and legal issues and not creating bad case law and making sure we had the right theory and did we call the right witness and don't forget to file this and that and the other thing so you don't miss a deadline and you have this evidence excluded. So we went on to handle her case, complicated issues, complicated damages, in my opinion, a complicated defense lawyer, which will always throw you for a curveball sometimes. And the focus became very legal. And we didn't create bad case law, and we handled her case, and she was happy with the outcome. It was not until my daughter, I'm going to look at Natalie Cody, because <laughs> she grew up with my daughter, was diagnosed with um, idiopathic juvenile scoliosis. I don't know why this just became super emotional for me. But um, I then learned in a really serious way, and I understood Jackie's struggle in a way that I hadn't when I represented her. And so it was my lived experience that brought me closer to understanding her lived experience in a way that I had at the time I handled her case. Because my daughter will most likely have the same 11 level spine fusion that Jackie had and lived with, and they will both live with that for the rest of their lives. In clinic, you get a whole person. And I challenge you to remind yourself as you are deep in academic for credit work that the law is about people and relationship. 
what a tremendous honor it is to steward the trust that clinic clients place in you as you help write their next chapter. Very best wishes for one of the best semesters yet. I promise you it will be that in more ways than one because of the people you serve. Thank you, and I now invite Professor Warren to introduce Judge Barnett. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to introduce Chief Judge Barnett to you. Um, he attended the University of Minnesota Law School where he earned his Juris Doctorate in 1992. During law school, he worked for the Hidden County Public Defender's Office as a law clerk. After graduation, he joined the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office as an attorney. He handled a variety of misdemeanor and felony cases and spent a significant portion of his career there handling juvenile delinquency and child protection cases. From 2001 to 2004, he was a senior attorney supervisor in its drug court unit. After 14 years with the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office, he joined the Hennepin County Attorney's Office as a senior assistant county attorney in the juvenile division. There, he prosecuted all types of delinquency cases. He had a special focus on certification of juveniles as adults and extended ju jurisdiction juvenile cases. Chief Judge Barnett was also responsible for the criminal sexual conduct team within the juvenile division. On February 6, 2006, Chief Judge Barnett was appointed to the Hidden County Judicial District Court bench. He served as the presiding judge of drug court for two years. He also served as the presiding judge of the criminal division. In 2016 and 2018, he was elected assistant chief judge and in May 2020 was elected its chief judge, making him the first chief judge of color in Minnesota. Since 2009, Chief Judge Barnett has been an avid participant in our law school's mentor externship program. Welcome. Thank you. I didn't know you were going to mention the year I graduated. <laughs> Listen to that, I felt kind of old, you know. Um, thank you, Professor Warren, uh, for that introduction. Um, Professor Warren's known me for a long time. Uh, I'm glad he gave me a nice introduction. He probably could have said a couple other things, but he didn't. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, before I administer the oath, I'm going to uh, tell you a story. Uh, before I get to that story, I, I have to say this. So you know, as you go through your legal career, you can get pretty full of yourself. I had that moment today. I was going over my speech and I was going, this is boring. <laughs> this is, I was talking about the meaning of an oath and all this, and I changed it. I absolutely changed it. I, I just really felt, uh, and I, and, and listening to the Dean talk that this is not the, it's not about the oath itself. It's about the people. And that's what this story is really about that I'm gonna tell you. Um, I grew up in Washington, DC, and I came out here to go to law school. I wasn't gonna say the year, but Professor Warren told you when I graduated. So came out here to go to law school in the fall of uh, 1989. Um, the first, well, it wasn't the first time I came to visit, but one of the times I came to visit out here, um, was in May and they took me around Lake of the Isles and, and Lake Cajon and it was a beautiful day and I ended up coming here to law school. So I had no intentions on practicing law, not one. I was going back to Washington DC with a law degree but no intentions on practicing the law. When I started my first year, um, it was tough. At the uh, that Socratic method and grading on a curve it just blew me away. I never experienced that uh, being called on and and coming up with answers and used to getting A's and B's and getting C's. It was tough. I did not think I was going to return. I um, 
Took that summer, um, went to Nairobi, Kenya, entered their law school for the summer, took some classes. I never told my family that I was thinking about not returning to law school. Uh, and I came back for my second year. And I took the misdemeanor prosecution and defense clinic with Professor Steve Simon. That class changed everything for me as a law student. Um, I'm gonna talk about one particular experience that uh, Professor Simon and I had. We represented a client on a misdemeanor case. And back then you appeared on the master trial calendar in the government center. And so the master trial calendar was in a big courtroom, it could be about as big as this. And all the lawyers would come and sit in a jury box and sit other places. Clients would be sitting in the spectator uh, section. And the judge who had the master cal calendar would call your case. You would come up with your client they would then tell you which judge you were assigned to for your trial and they would sign you out. And that's what happened to us. We got assigned out to trial. We went in, we talked to the judge, the prosecutor, we worked out a deal, went back, talked to the client, told the client what the deal was. He said, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. I said, oh, okay. Went back in the courtroom, waited and waited. Went back out, went in the bathroom, couldn't find him. I was like, gosh, something happened to him? Steve Simon knew exactly what happened to him. He left. He left the building. Steve, Professor Simon said, get on the phone, call him, tell him to return. I'm like, what am I supposed to tell him? He said, tell him it's going to get worse. If he does not come back, a warrant's going to go out for him and things will be worse. So I got on the phone and that's what I said. And he returned, he came back to where we were and he didn't want the Jewish guy with all the legal experience. He wanted to talk to me all by myself. Scared the crap out of me. Scared to death to talk to him by myself. Professor Simon knew exactly what was happening. At that moment, that person wanted me because I looked like him. That was it. He, that's why he wanted to talk to me. I didn't know my way around the courtroom. I didn't know the law. I wasn't admitted to practice law in the state of Minnesota after taking the bar exam, but he still wanted to talk to me. At that moment, our client became my client. He trusted me. He wanted to know if he could trust Professor Simon. He wanted to know if this was a good deal or not. He wanted to know, should he take the deal? He was asking me what to do. So I tell you this story only for three reasons. One, because people might trust you just because you're a man or a woman, African-American, Asian-American, Native American, white, Latino, gay, lesbian. They might just trust you just because of that. But you are you, and they're trusting you, and they're trusting you because you have this legal knowledge that they don't have. We have more in common than you think. There's not one single client that I represented that I didn't have something in common with them. And we have to remember that and remember about building relationships. The second thing I want to tell you is that it, this story, I hope, illustrates the power that you have. You have the power to influence people's decisions at critical points in their lives. Don't take it for granted. 
your client will look for you for guidance and assistance in a very complicated legal system that can be frustrating, frightening, and unfair at times. The third reason I'm telling you this, and it comes from my time here at St. Thomas, this is an opportunity for you to showcase your brand. You have the opportunity to establish a foundation for your reputation. And when you enter that courtroom, no one cares about your grades. No one cares about what law school you went to. They wanna know, can you do a good job? Judges don't sit around and say, Gosh, I wonder if that person's from St. Thomas that appeared in front of me. They don't think that. You know what we say? That's a good lawyer. That's a bad lawyer. That's it. Same thing your client's going to say. Judges want your best. The legal profession wants your best at that moment. Whatever you can give, they want your best. But most of all, your client wants your best. Today, I will administer the oath. Unfortunately, in today's world, we have to be reminded that the power of an oath derives from the fact that in it, we ask God to bear witness to the promises we make with the implicit expectation that he will hold us accountable for the manner in which we honor them. That's a quote from James L. Buckley. So thank you for having me, students. I'm going to administer the oath. Please stand. So you're going to hear me say I, and then you're going to say your name. You probably, I don't know if you got a copy of it. And then um, I'll say do, and you can say I swear or affirm. You don't have to say I swear or affirm. You can say I, Todd Barnett, affirm. And I'll stop after every couple of words, and um, you'll be admitted. All right, how about that right hand? Thank you, I, what's your name? Deuce, swear, all right, there we go. Now we get to the easy part. All right, usually I do it with one person. I don't do it in a group. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and that of the state of Minnesota I forgot to make it official. I'm so sorry. What was it? What, what was it? Some, um, who swore in Obama and Mr. Word? Oh, oh, shoot. Robert's <laughs> Mr. Word. So we, we won't make this mistake. I think the, <laughs> I think the road makes it official. Okay, we start again, but we're going to do it correctly this time. I. Do swear. Okay, thank you. All right. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that of the state of Minnesota. And that of the state of Minnesota. And will conduct myself as a certified law student practitioner. And will conduct myself as a certified law student practitioner. In an upright and courteous manner. To the best of my learning and ability, with all good fidelity, as well to the court as to the client, and that I will use no falsehood or deceit, nor delay any person's cause for lucre or malice. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. You can be seated. So I believe in your pad folios, there is um, a certification form. And following the ceremony, uh, Judge Barnett will sign that, and um, I think we'll collect those and make copies of them for you. 
My name is Virgil Wiebe. I'm one of the clinical faculty here, and I have the honor of sort of closing the ceremony, and there have been personal stories shared, and I will follow suit. Uh, in the immigration clinic, we're doing naturalization cases this semester, and recently I came across the naturalization papers of my great-grandfather. And in 1881, and, and so um, what it sort of impressed upon me is both the, the individual nature of oaths and affirmations, but also that they happen in a larger context, and we need to remember that context. In 1881, he um, uh, made his intention clear to become a US citizen. At that time, you had to declare an intent in advance of becoming a citizen, and then you had had to wait three years before you could then get your citizenship. And uh, I'm particularly proud of my great grandfather because uh, as, as I read through this declaration of intent, everywhere there's the word sworn, it's scratched out and affirmed is written in. Um, we, I come from a, a religious tradition that takes affirmations rather than oaths um, based on some scriptures in the Bible about letting your yes be yes and your no be no and not taking oaths. So um, it was an inspiration for me to see that that had happened, you know, within a decade of his arriving in the United States. Um, uh, so um, he then waited until 1899 to finish the process. And so he forswear all allegiance to Nicholas the third Tsar of Russia as part of the process, and then became a citizen in 1899. So between sort of more for the context between 1881 and 1899, the US passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which kept virtually all Chinese people from immigrating to the United States. And that was upheld by the, by the Supreme Court in 1889. So um, that's sort of a reminder that I came from a, a group that was privileged to be able to come to the United States when other groups were not. Um, and, and we need to remember that there may be individual acts that we take, but it's, it's in a larger context. Um, so with that, I'm just going to say congratulations again to you and we'll have a reception out front. And if you want to line up and, and uh, have your certification signed by the judge, that would be great.